hi everyone, and thank you for, for coming. Uh, how many of you are JavaScript developers? I get most of you, right? Okay, I think that you are going to find this talk very interesting, and I want to start with a question. Does it sound familiar to you? It's undefined, it's not a function. Right, I bet that you have an error tracker, maybe, that is full of errors like this, or like this. It's pretty much the same thing, right? But it's something that happens all the time when you're working with JavaScript. But JavaScript alone, not TypeScript, not static type addons or whatever. But also, if you are working usually in API services, probably you also have an error tracker and you are used to see this number all the time. So what happens is that these are three these three things represent the same thing. Not only an error, but something that you don't expect to happen in your system at all, but it's happening all the time. And then you go to your error tracker, and this is kind of your face, right? <laughs> when you're looking at that, like, I write perfect code. How is this even possible? That happens. Yeah, because everyone thinks that the code that they write is great and you consider every edge case, but the sad truth is that you always design for the success a scenario and maybe the common error a scenario. But the bad news is that shit happens and you are going to see all the time errors in your tracker if you are using raw JavaScript and if you don't think about an, a specific explicit error handling approach. So this is why I'm going to speak about modeling errors in now CLI. But actually, this is the second time I give this talk. And this now CLI thing can be actually dropped. This is more about modeling errors in JavaScript in general. So I think that if you are a JavaScript developer, you are going to find this very useful. And I'm going to show you stuff that you can actually apply in your day by day work. So my name is Javier Velasco. That is my Twitter handle. I'm AKA 15 kilo dog guy. <laughs> that is my beautiful dog. And as Patrick said, I work for this company called Zite. In Zite, probably many of you, if you are working with uh, uh, cloud computer and stuff like that, are familiar with this, uh, especially if you work in the JavaScript ecosystem, are familiar with this, uh, la this company. Uh, what we do, is uh, our claim is to make cloud computing as easy as possible. So you can take a website, any kind of service that you have in your local, and just with a small configuration file and typing one single command, we can put it into the cloud, just like that. So with this simplicity of usage, it comes with a great cost. Like every time that you try to reduce complexity for your clients, you are, in, you are facing that complexity that you are hiding. That makes some of our products that have a very simple interface very complicated under the covers. And the most um, interesting example of this complexity is one of our products, which is now. It's like the main, the core product in our, in our company. Uh, basically, when you write now in your project, you can create, you can deploy it immediately, and you will get a unique URL that is like an identifier of your deployment. So you can access your deployment by visiting that URL. But usually, what you would want to do is to change that URL to a custom domain that you can have in your account, or maybe you want to change it to a subdomain that ends with a custom domain that you add. For the, and, th and this specific feature is called now alias. And this is how it works. So basically, you type now alias, your deployment URL, and then you can alias to a different URL. Then we are going to do a bunch of stuff under the covers. And finally, you will get a success, <coughs> hopefully, with the, uh, out the, the, the output of the of that operation. So you can visit later this another that have it at SH, and it's going to show the original deployment. So this might seem like something simple to do, 
But again, we are doing many, many things under the covers. So imagine that this domain, habit.sh, is not in your account. We have two choices here. One choice is to tell you, we can't create the alias because there is no, you, you don't have this domain, you don't own this domain, or we can try to fix it for you if we identify the, and consider the error in the workflow. Like for example, we can say, um, you uh, don't own this domain, so we are going to try to check the availability API to know if you can purchase this domain. Then if it's positive result, we are going to check the price. Then we are going to show you that you can purchase this domain for whatever price. Then uh, if you accept, we are going to try to purchase the, the domain. And then we retry. And then you fi we find that you are missing a, a certificate. So we have to call the certificate API, and that also can fail in many, many ways. So the amount of errors that can happen and you have to control in our alias are the aggregation of many APIs, certificates, purchasing, pricing, availability, etc. But in the end, what we are providing at the level code is just a function that encapsulates all of this behavior. So the contract of this function is that we receive an alias, we receive a deployment URL, a user ID and team ID, and the, credential, uh, the credentials are going under the covers. But this is the contract of the function. So how can we handle all the stuff that can happen here, all of the errors? The easy way, and the way that many people usually do, and I did it sometimes in some pieces of the code, is to try catch and say, I'm sorry, but your alias didn't work, but you don't know why. So <laughs> I don't know about your thoughts, but I, I don't think this is a very good solution, right? We are swallowing every error. Um, and the output of this, is, the outcome is that we are going to lose customers because somebody wants to alias and you want to get information to fix the error yourself if you can fix it. So we have to give some context and a proper error message. So to get to that point, the first thing we have to question is, why don't we handle errors? Why we usually do this thing instead of giving nice errors? And I have a few reasons that I think that we can consider. The first and most important reason, in my opinion, is the lack of context. So for example, uh, say that you are consuming this code. You have this create alias function. And inside of this function, many things are going to happen. Like for example, we are going to fetch the user, and that can already error with a user not found, for example, or credentials are invalid or whatever. Then we try to fetch the domain for the alias, and then we request uh, to create the alias. And this is a different function where we are going to validate the input of that create alias, and then we are going to perform the request against a server. But then, maybe, you are missing a certificate. So the server is going to error. And when it errors, it's going to return um, um, a, a very specific error, like you are missing a certificate for the requested alias, for example. But you know what? In that perform request function, the input has no domain. It has only the alias. So if you want to say there, if you want to create or handle the error there, you can't have in the context the domain itself because that was parsed and was considered outside of the function. So the point is that when you want to show an error of a complex process like this, you want to give the information in the context of create alias, not the information in the context of request create alias when you're performing the API request. So that is lack of context. And we are usually too lazy to gather all of this information. And also passing the domain to, them, to that function just to show an error is not a good option. It's not a good choice because you are mixing uh, parameters that are not required for the function to do the, the job. Um, another reason is that we usually don't know the complete error space. Like you are consuming an API and you don't know in how many ways it can fail. 
So to solve this, the only thing that you can do is to go and check documentation, and hopefully the documentation will be detailed enough to know what can happen. So going back to this diagram, imagine that in this perform request, we receive an error and we check the documentation and we saw um, that it can return, let's say, four different error codes with four different payloads. But then the developers updated the API and they add a new error. So you are receiving an error here that you never considered. So what can you do? You just fail and you don't know why. You can do nothing, basically. And that's because you don't know the error space. And I'm, setting this, I'm saying this example here with an external API, but that can happen at, an, at, um, at a code function, at a function level. Like for example, this perform request function can return or throw, let's say throw, four different errors, and maybe at some point I add a new error. When that happens, I'm going to say, hey, domain permission error, that's a new error. And the consumer is facing the same problem. The function is failing in a way that you never considered, so you can do nothing, right? And you have to know the error space. But unfortunately, there is no other way. And the third reason is that we are lazy. We are lazy because when you get a feature to be shipped and you are doing a demo for that feature, you don't type the domain wrong on purpose. <laughs> you don't try to fetch a deployment that doesn't exist. What you do is to run the command uh, with your knowledge that it's going to work, that is the success scenario, and then it works just fine. But then your users don't know anything about your product. They don't have the information that you have when you're using the product. So they use it badly, and they get an error that you never considered because you were too lazy to get the context and show a proper error, or because you missed the error space and something that you never considered is happening there. So let's try to fix that. How can we face those situations? Um, the first thing I want to think of is how can we represent errors? Because the error representation is not common across our programs, usually. Like, sometimes you return an object, and inside of that object you have an error field with an object that has a code. I mean, I hope to have a code in that error. Maybe I don't, right? Or, at, uh, or sometimes you just throw. So you have to write this try catch, and then check what is caught, and if it's known somehow, you return or do something or re re throw a different error or whatever. But how can we represent errors in a, in a uniform way? So to represent errors properly, I think that we have to know first where the error happened, because that's important information that we can, uh, that we can need if we want to track the error or something. Also, we have to know what is the metadata. When an error happened, it happened with an input. So you want to know what is that input. And uh, you also want to know why did it happen. And you can use a message for that. And also, it would be nice if all the errors are uniform in a way that you can match all errors together. So, and, and this is the only, the only scenario, as far as I remember, where I like to use prototypical inheritance and classes. Right? So you can define a very generic class that extends from error. And we are going to call it now error. It would be like the representation of something that happened in the system that should be controlled. right? And then we can have more uh, granulated errors like for example this one, domain not found. And we are going to make them stem for now error, and now error is going to extend from error. So we have like the, the call stack trace, for example, and we have some information like exactly where it happened, uh, I mean the, the, the stack trace. Um, and also we can match, like if, uh, if this instance of domain not found is an instance, instance of an error. Um, so, also, you can pass this uh, a specific payload, so any error uh, will be well-formed, and you will know 
that a domain not found error when you match the instance is going to have in the payload the domain name and the context name. So you can populate errors that you know that we always have the context. And you will use it like this. You just throw new error, throw new domain not found error with the domain and the context in that case. Later you just say, if the error is an instance of domain not found, then you can access error that domain name to show a proper message, for example. And then if you want to do something super generic in your application, you can just check against the instance of now error. That is a very powerful way to classify errors. Um, so yeah, that's it. So where should we control errors? This is the second one. Like we are identifying an error, then we throw this new error that is properly modeled, but where do you control it? And I think that the answer is the entry point of your code. Like in now CLI, for example, this super generic create alias function is the entry point for that workflow. Where should we control the errors? In that case that I showed before, I think that create alias, which is the closest place to the user input, is the, the, the best place to do it. And there is a very particular reason for this, because if we control the error at a level of perform request, and perform request is something that we use across all of our functions, maybe there are places where you consume it in the first layer, and it's okay if you cut the flow and just show an error, but sometimes it's going to be hidden between layers and layers uh, of call stacks. And in that scenario, you don't want to behave like that. You don't want to stop the execution. You just want to communicate that the function errors somehow. So in that particular case of perform request, we can have uh, a model error, API error, that can look like this. So uh, this perform request function is a function that we that we that is intended to be used for any request in our application. So when we do something like this, if we find that the response status is higher than 100, so the API failed somehow, we are going to create a very generic error, which is an API error. This means that in any entry point of your application, you can do if try catch and if the func if the error that I get is an API error, I can log the URL, for example. So I can give you nice information about it. So when you consume this, you can do something like this. I'm going to await create alias, and when it fails, I am going to check if this is an instance of an API error. In case it is an instance of API errors, I'm going to show the message that I'm getting from the API. But if not, I don't know what happened. Maybe it's a type error or whatever. So I just tell you, I'm sorry, it didn't work. Right? So, um, the thing is that the API error makes sense for the consumer of perform request. But when we handle the error at a level of create alias, we don't want to say an API request failed with this message of this or, or, or this code. Because the, uh, the, the fact that the API request failed is meaningful only for request create alias, because that is the function that is doing the actual request. We don't know from create alias what request create alias is doing, not necessarily. So we don't have to know that it's failing like that. So this means that what we can do is to model a more uh, a specific error in request create alias. Why? Because in request create alias, we know what is the API that we are going to consume, and we know in how many ways that API can fail. So instead of just throwing and getting that API error, what we are going to do is to do a try catch block in the request create alias uh, function and check if the error code is, for example, cert, mi cert missing. So we can pattern match all the possible errors. And there is no other way around that checking the documentation or something to be sure of the error space in this case, because you don't have control over the API. Um, but once you identify a cert missing error, you can create a more meaningful error. You can say that the cert is missing for an alias, specifically. So you can add information in the payload, like the alias, like the domain, like the deployment URL, and basically all of the information that is in request create alias. 
So later, when you consume them, that function in the top layer, what you do now is you check if it's a cert missing for alias error. And then you can say, not that the API fail, but instead you can say, there is no cert for this domain, so we can't set the alias. And you can even give a suggestion. And you can say, you can create a cert by running, and you can even give the specific command that the user has to run to try to fix it by himself. Uh, then if the error is not that one, you know that it could be an API error. So you can say, there was an API error, and if it was none of this, then you don't know what happened, right? So that is, uh, that is very cool. But, sorry. What happens if um, I add a new error? Remember the unknown error space. So imagine that now I go to perform request and I add a new error that can be thrown. Or if the, as, I as I said before, if the server fails somehow with an error that you don't really know, then the perform request, check that error, throw it back, and you don't know that error. So there is a, in, in conceptually, the problem with this is that you can never know what are the errors that a function can throw without inspecting the code. So you ask yourself the question, what are the errors that this function can throw? And I want to know that without inspecting the code. You just don't know, because this is JavaScript. You can't do anything. What makes you think, what is an error? Because usually, um, and we are assuming here that when an error happens, we throw an exception. Did you know an exception should be something exceptional, not something that is used to handle errors in general? Um, so if an error is the output of an operation and I'm calling a function, what's the point of getting a success and just a success? and then try catch, and maybe I get an error that I know, or maybe an error that I don't know. So what if we return the errors instead of, instead of throwing? And this is when it gets interesting, because we can very easily write a wrapper for our, for our functions, like a higher order function, that is going to return errors instead of throwing errors, but only the errors that we say specifically. Like if you check that code, what we do is to pass a function and an array of error types, errors that we know that the function can throw. Then we try, and if the function is not failing, we are going to return a tuple. I'm pretty sure many of you already are aware of React hooks, so probably you're familiar with this uh, tuple returning thingy. Uh, so the first one is going to be the success, and if it, succeed, it succeeded, we are going to return in the second member of the tuple uh, new. But if we catch an error, we are going to check if it's a known error. And if, in case it, consta it contains an instance of that uh, array of errors, we are going to return new in the success and the error in the second element of that array. And if we don't know what happened, we are going to just throw. So we change the way functions behave like this. Like you can say, perform a request, but instead of throwing, if you get an API error, you are going to return that API error. Or imagine that you can pass also like a cert missing error or whatever other error that you are aware of. So now we change a little bit the semantics here. Because a function is going to throw when you don't know what's going to, when, when it's something unexpected. And the function instead is going to return something when it's an error that is expected and it's modeled as a part of your program. But still you don't know because this is JavaScript. You still don't know. Are you, do you know about TypeScript? Because if you don't have types, this is you trying to figure out what errors are returned from a function and what are the possible values that a function throws. And if you don't know, you never use TypeScript, this is how it feels, right? Like, 
putting the, the like putting the the the, the pass yes, there. So let's write a type for this request create alias function, and it would be as simple as this, and this can be inferred. You don't really need to write the type for every single function, but this, the signature will be something like this. We are going to have a function that gets a string, 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 and is going to return a promise that resolves in either alias or submission for alias, being alias and submission for alias error tuples. And this is really magical. If you are not familiar with TypeScript, you are not going to understand this, and there is no reason for you to understand it. It's perfectly fine. But um, we can have a function that we are going to call the error handler. So this function is going to take an error, something, we don't know what it is, and it's going to return a never. A never is something specific from TypeScript and uh, um, from static type languages. And basically, in, that fu in, in a function or in your code, when you have a variable that can be either an integer or, or, a, or a, um, a number or a string, if you type check first the string, later you know that it can only be a number, and then you check the number, and after that you know that that's unreachable. That is a never. The type of, the, of that uh, variable would be never. So we have a function that would receives something, and we have to make sure that we check every possible type of that error and then return what we received in the, in the end. So we are making a contract there, a function that where we are saying, you have to pattern match every possible value of error. And TypeScript, in the latest version, has these super nice inference helpers uh, where you can uh, write something like this. So you have here, uh, that you have a function, you are going to get the type that the function returns, that you know that is a promise, and then we are going to get the resolve value. So that type there is going to be the, what the function results. And then you can have like an error tuple here. You don't need to understand this, but when you decorate a type like this, what we are going to get is that in the contract that we said before, you are going to get the possible amount of errors that that function might return. So then your error handler becomes something like this. Like you pass a, fun um, a function, a function type, and the error is going to be the errors in the tuple of the result value of that function. So you have to write it once. And then this is how you use it. You say, my alias error handler is going to receive, the, in the type of the function create alias, the result value, all the errors, those are the errors that I'm going to receive in this function. And it should throw either never, it should return either never or new. So when we pattern match like this, there, error is no. But it's no only if the function create alias return only a cert missing for alias error. So then, if we go and add somewhere in our code, it doesn't matter how many layers you have, it doesn't matter how big is the call stack, if you add one single error anywhere, this function would not compile. It's not going to compile, because it's going to tell you this function is supposed to return either null or never, and it's returning an error. And it's going to tell you exactly what error is. So then the consumer becomes something like this. You call create alias with your parameters, you get an alias or maybe an error. And then with that specific function passing the error, if you don't handle every possible error that the function can throw, this will not compile. So just to recap, First, you have to know the error space that you're dealing with. To know the error space, you can use TypeScript, for example. Then you should always make a separation between what is expected error and what is an unexpected error. Also, returning expected errors work, works better than throwing because the look is going to look cleaner, of course, but also you, can, you, you don't need to write any try-catch block never ever. 
because something that uh, is strong is something that you don't expect to happen. A static typing can force you to handle those errors that we say, like we just saw with the error handler, type like that. And then you can build richer errors when you are returning a, as you scale, a scale in, the, in the call stack. Because in every layer, you have more information to add to that error. And of course, uh, if you're using VS Code and you're using TypeScript, when you call that create alias function, you over the result and you see the 30 possible errors that the function can return. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much, Javi. Are there any questions? No questions? There's one. Oh, nice. Do you sometimes decide to uh, show the stack trace or the raw error of, of some external tool to the customer, or is this something... Of, of something that we consume, you mean? Yes, for, for example. Uh, no, usually, I, I mean, what we do always is to uh, try to hide the details. Like, for example, if we are using a Stripe under the covers, we are not going to show errors that comes from a Stripe. We are going to identify what are the possible errors that the Stripe can return, or in how many ways a Stripe can fail. And we are going to tell you that, for example, you are missing the credit card, or that you have no funds, or whatever. But we have to pattern match against this code. That's why it's important to handle errors properly and to type errors if it's always possible. Because otherwise, if, the, if a Stripe just return a message, we can't do something like this, right? Any more questions over there? Um, are you using this kind of pattern somewhere else as well? I mean, you can model all kinds of things with that, right? I mean, some, it's just some error. what? Sorry. This this kind of pattern of modeling yeah. the errors, you can use that somewhere else as well. Like you can model your state in your UI. In yeah, we UI. we actually we started using this approach. Not exactly this, but something very very close. Like for example, at first what we did is instead of returning a tuple with the error and the and the possible success value, um, instead of uh, having I mean, if you, the problem is that you consume this create alias function, for example, and then just below, you have to write the handling uh, function. If you don't do that, then it won't matter, right? So at first, to prevent us from writing that uh, specifically, what we did is to uh, return one variable, one result, either that is either the error, the possible errors, or the success. So you are forced to pattern match everything in order to say, OK, this is the success. And then when you return something else, it's going to fail. But that approach started there because of the complexity, because um, there are many processes involved. But now it worked pretty well. And we are moving many projects to TypeScript. So as we are moving new pro and doing new projects, we are doing these techniques in the back end too. Right? That, that's what I was saying. Like this is this is valid everywhere. So we are using this all across the the, the, the code base. Yeah. One last question. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. This conference has been incredibly getting better for me. The quality of the lineup is usually really, really good, and this is something I'm really saying thumbs up. They're really try to get speakers here that are pushing to the future of web technologies. I just feel like it's a very community-driven conference. It also is a lot of quality, and people are just nice. Hi, my name is Sarah, and this is Asian Conf in Dornbun. Amazing venue, Austria is beautiful. Meeting all of the people in the community and getting to go and hang out and ski.